I want to add my thanks to Filippo Berardelli for inviting me today here and I want to also to add my personal memory for uh, G.B. Rossi. Actually, I'm one of those ex-young people that were supported by him. Actually, uh, I probably would not be here without him because he was giving me my first grant as independent PI when I came back from France. So this is really Orbetello meetings and so on. This is really a memory and it's really a pleasure to, to be an honor to be invited here to talk about what? About lessons from clinical use of interferon in patients with viral hepatitis. We go back to viruses, we go back in a completely different scenario. Uh, only 15 minutes to go through what we achieved, what we can still do, uh, what we understood about how to use interference in those, in these two uh, chronic infection. We have to remind that we have two different, completely different scenarios. In hepatitis C and RNAV virus, we aim for definitive clearance and we have a clinical uh, uh, correlate that is sustained biological response, so we go for viral suppression and replication, and we have different regimens with and without interferon now that we can use. For hepatitis B virus, a DNA virus with a, a retro transcription step in, in the life cycle, we have a completely different uh, situation. We do have a very successful drug for long-term suppression that are not interferon do use, still use interferon to get what can be called a functional cure, that means some suppression of viral uh, replication without the need to continue the, the, the treatment. So we have viral suppression and functional cure for hepatitis B, and I will go through the two, to do the, the, the two scenarios and the two histories. For hepatitis C, hepatitis C, uh, I started uh, when I came back and I started to do clinical work with 6% of sustained biological response in uh, overall in hepatitis C patients. Uh, and now with uh, pegidated interferon plus rebevirin, we are at 55 and since a couple of years, less than one year in Italy because we are slow in getting new drugs. We do have combination with the first generation protease inhibitors and we do get in the uh, genotypes that in which we can use this combination nowadays, uh, we can get more than 70% of the sustained biological response. So it's something that in the life of one doctor has changed completely the scenario of, uh, of treatment is even more impressive or at least as impressive as what we heard from Robin Foy in, uh, in hematology uh, overall. A sustained biological response is a very important uh, clinical correlate uh, because it's not a, a solid clinical endpoint but translates into a solid clinical endpoint because it's durable. When you get it, you keep it and it translates into a decrease in mortality for both liver uh, related death and uh, non-liver related death because HCV infection is also an increased death uh, in patients for non-liver related um, reasons, cardiovascular and so on. So hepatitis C is a really an internal medicine disease, not only a virological disease and a, 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 a liver disease uh, per se. And we also know that there are some low-grade lymphomas associated with HCV infection in which interferon is still a role and so on. So sustained virological response, a clear endpoint. What happens when, uh, why interferon? What happens when uh, the virus uh, enters uh, in, our, uh, in our bodies and what happens when the, the, uh, the, the, the infection is established. Uh, both in chimpanzees, that is a good system for animal system for hepatitis C infection, and in some patients, not in all patients, there is a strong activation of the uh, interferon system in the liver. That means that the virus is seen and there is an innate immune response that is part of the, of the response, but as I told you, is also present in chronic uh, uh, liver infection by hepatitis C. So that means that this response is not linked necessarily to clearance. And we heard a lot about the mechanism of persistence by Vincenzo Barnum uh, before. But now there is a, a little bit more complication. We are speaking about interferon alpha, but in the case of hepatitis C, we know now that also, uh, type 3 interference are very, very important in the interplay between the virus and the host. And both uh, lambda interference and uh, alpha beta interference are activated in, uh, in the context of hepatitis, of hepatitis C infection. Indeed, hepatitis C induces interferon. And also, 
try to stop the interferon mediated responses by uh, using some proteins to interfere with the intracellular signaling of interferon, Regai and so on. Um, and what happens finally is that you have induction and secretion of a first wave of interferon uh, alpha and beta and a new uh, effect on the, on the cells, infected cells and neighboring cells. But which uh, interferons are activated in hepatitis C? We know now that lambda interferons, uh, type 3 interferons, the not interferon uh, alpha beta are the major player in the uh, activated uh, liver uh, in response to, uh, to uh, hepatitis C. So uh, uh, interferon alpha is what we use in therapy. What starts the activation of the interferon uh, system and interferon dependent transcriptome in hepatitis C is very likely interferon lambda in patients. This does not mean that there are not roles for interferon alpha beta, but these are the studies that uh, uh, were performed in vivo, ex vivo, and on primary hepatocytes. Whatever we knew before was done in hepatocellular carcinoma cell lines. That is not the best way to investigate it. And this has also to do with another story that is peculiar for hepatitis C, because a few years ago, uh, through uh, genome-wide association studies looking for SNPs associated with the specific outcomes in hepatitis C patients treated with interferon and ribavirin. Uh, it was discovered that uh, some SNPs, some polymorphism in interferon uh, in the inter interleukin 28B uh, interferon lambda uh, promoter region in chromosome 19, there are some SNPs that clearly correlate with the clinical response to therapy. Uh, and. Uh, it was very striking, the haplotype, the genotype, the TT versus uh, CT or CC, all the doctors have already learned this because this is the most successful story of association of any SNP, of any genetic marker, and this is outcome in the story. It, is, it has been so devastating because we learned about that and we started to use it and we discovered that with the new therapies is not useful anymore. So we started to do polymorphism. Everybody started to look for the polymorphism. We know that it's important not only in the, in, in the response to therapy, but also in the spontaneous clearance from acute uh, hepatitis C infection. And now we, we don't have so much use of it uh, anymore. Uh, anyway, there, uh, there, are, there is a complex interplay between the uh, interleukin 28 uh, uh, genotype, uh, aplotype in terms of SNP, uh, and uh, the hepatic expression of interference and uh, stimulated genes. But the overall uh, consensus now is that indeed there are differences in the amount of and the spectrum of interference stimulated genes that are activated in the liver of patients according to their interleukin 28 uh, genotype. And this may, might be important for therapy. Why might be important for therapy? Because there is one Another big lesson that we learned from translational medicine applied to treatment of, with interferon in uh, hepatitis C patients is that the response to therapy in uh, uh, there is a pointer somewhere no not anymore uh, the response to pegylated interferon ribavirin treatment in hepatitis C patients is dependent on the specific. Uh, uh, expression profile of interferon uh, stimulated genes in the liver. There is a subset of genes stimulated by interferon that is upregulated before pharmacological use of interferon in the patients that will not respond to therapy. In other terms, to make this simple, there is a subset of genes that the virus activate through interferon that block the response to the exogenous interferon when this will be used as a therapy to try to eradicate the chronic infection. And uh, another lesson that we learned is that interferon is wonderful, but adding something that we do not know yet how it works, that is ribavirin, uh, we do get better results. And this was, has been a conundrum for a while because we really uh, try to to explain how ribavirin, not how, uh, us, but everybody tried to explain how ribavirin was working through the multiple and very, uh, uh, a lot of fantasy uh, uh, to explain this, but uh, finally we still do not know. And we were really interested in that and us and a few other groups tried to really understand what, thank you, what, um, what could be the what could be the mechanism? 
What we know is that the interferon is activated in many patients, that ribavirin in vitro potentiates the uh, stimulation of uh, certain uh, ISGs uh, in, uh, together with interferon, so is is additive or synergistic towards certain genes in certain cells, not in all the cells. And what we uh, discovered, and what was also discovered by Jake Lian group in vivo, uh, studying patients that were getting in the old days only ribavirin for some reason, is not the way to treat them, but there were few trials doing that, that there are a, another subset of genes that are repressed by uh, ribavirin. So are interferon-stimulated uh, genes that are not activated but repressed by ribavirin. They show it this kind of repression in vivo. We show it this in vitro, and we made the observation that this was easy to observe not in uh, cancer cells, in hepatocellular carcinoma cells, but was much more evident in, uh, in cells that were uh, primary hepatocytes or non-transformed HPG cells. Repressed genes, so interferon doesn't uh, activate, no. Uh, coming in the uh, era of genomics, we do know that there are genes that are activated by interferon and genes that are not activated by repressed. We studied in these papers that were published a couple of years ago, 100 genes, uh, and we studied the expression and we studied the chromatin on the promoters of these genes and we could clearly classify activated and repressed genes and uh, correlate the status of the chromatin in terms of which complexes are there regulating transcription uh, and the way to activate and block genes. And uh, activation is not, is not always recruitment of a, of a complex, uh, stat1, stat2 complex, sometimes activation is just reshuffling a, a pre-existing complex, actually 50% of the genes already have stat1 and stat2 on their promoter before interferon is given. So the complexity is, is there. But what, uh, coming back to ribavirin, what happens? We showed that in uh, responding, again, this is uh, uh, patients, biopsies taken from patients that got ribavirin alone because there was a period uh, five, ten years ago, in between five and ten years ago, in which people were trying ribavirin alone to see whether there was some antiviral effect. And looking at those, uh, at those uh, uh, biopsies, we could clearly demonstrate that in the non-responder patients, differently from responder patients, ribavirin was actually decreasing some genes and which genes exactly the genes that have been correlated before with the non-response to interferon. So somehow ribavirin was resetting the liver to an interferon responsive state. This does not mean that the same will happen in hematological condition or in melanocytes or whatever, but in the liver we got fair amount of, of, uh, of uh, data and we also went into the mechanism and what we could uh, show was that ribavirin is uh, uh, fostering the recruitment of uh, a repressor complex that contains the histomethyltransferase G9 on the promoters, and in this way there is an epigenetic silencing of these genes that are inappropriately uh, activated in non-responder patients. So this is ribavirin, the new drugs, I told you the PI inhibitors, there are more new drugs, and now we will not, starting from next year or two years from now, we will not be happy if we don't cure more than 90% of our patients, because we know from the clinical trials that we can do it. A number of drugs, a number of targets, not only the protease inhibitors, the NS5 uh, inhibitors, the NS5B inhibitors, uh, nucleoside and no, uh, nucle uh, nucleotides and non-nucleotide uh, inhibitors of the polymerase, a, lo uh, the, a lot of na uh, names, some are stopped, the, the red ones are the ones that are going fast through uh, uh, phase three. Actually, the sofosbuvir here and simeprevir got the approval, and sofosbuvir is already in the in the drug stores, in the pharmacies in in the U.S. and in some European uh, countries for the use in hepatitis C uh, in hepatitis C patients. So the scenario for the future is triple therapy with pegylated interferon ribavirin and first generation PIs that are not good, a lot of side effects, a lot of resistance. Triple therapy with the new and better protease inhibitors, imeprevir for example, uh, or triple therapy with uh, pegylated interferon uh, um, uh, ribavirin and uh, a, a, a polymerase inhibitor like sofosbuvir, 
very few resistance, very good. Quadruple therapy, interferon-free regimens. There are a number of interferon-free regimens coming, and so the scenario, and I'm not happy, but uh, this is the reality, is that interferon is going down. There will be a little proportion of patients that will still need the difficult ones, very complex therapy, but most of the patients and the expectation of the patients and the doctor is toward interferon-free uh, interferon uh, um, regimens. And the, all the characteristics of a needle therapy are there. There is only one that is not there, affordable. So if interferon will, still, will be still there uh, after 2015, 2016, uh, will not be for a question of efficacy, will be of a question of we cannot afford the other therapy everywhere in the world. And the HIV story with, uh, with the access to drugs is a, is a big story. Few slides to go into the hepatitis B virus, in which the story is completely different. The virus persists. Even if we suppress, the virus is still there. Why? Because the CCC DNA, that is the replicative intermediate, is resistant, is always there, whether the patient is suppressed with nucleotides, whether the patient is in functional cure with interferon, you still find in most of the patients the CCC DNA in the, in the liver. So the aim here is to increase the number of patients which we can have a functional cure, suppress it, even with the CCC DNA at a low level, for a long time without a therapy, or eradicate the CCC DNA. Which strategy? New viral targets and the immune system. Hepatitis B is completely different from hepatitis C. The virus is stealth, does not induce an interferon response. It induces a very, very little and transient interferon response, innate immune response and interferon response. Uh, and why this? Probably because there is one protein that comes with the virus even before the virus starts to replicate that blocks innate immunity. This protein is the core protein. These are studies made by Fabian Zulim and Barbara Testoni that was previous postdoc from my lab. Now she is in Lyon. And they could demonstrate that core protein just after infection goes on, on interferon lambda 1, 2, and 3 and interferon beta promoters and shut down their transcription. So the virus is possibly seen but is not does not translate into innate immunity because the virus itself is a very potent uh, mechanism to, to block it. So what to do? The core protein, we could work on the core protein to reactivate, uh, uh, use it as a target to reactivate the innate immunity to block the replication somehow. Uh, yes, we can. Why? Because the virus, the CCC DNA is like a mini chromosome. It is regulated by the same epigenetic mechanism that regulate the, the cellular chromosomes. And we and others demonstrated that there is a clear cut correlation between epigenetic control of the mini chromosome and replication. So we can think of epigenetically silencing the, the, uh, the CCC DNA. And interferon, what it does in hepatitis B, it does exactly this. Besides the immune stimulatory uh, activities that I will not negate in this, uh, in this audience, uh, in front of this audience, uh, interferon, we showed that in both in cells and in, human, and in, uh, uh, in vivo in, uh, in mouse models, is uh, repressing the CCC DNA directly by recruiting a complex, a transcription complex that is the PRC2 complex, and especially ZEST2 that is an histone methyl transferase and uh, uh, CIRT1. And uh, so there is a kind of epigenetic control that is probably superposed or precedes going to the stop, precedes the capacity of uh, interferon to activate uh, the immune system. And if interferon does something to the immune system, it's not on adaptive uh, responses, because this is a paper published by Carlo Ferrari group. In the first six months of pegated interferon therapy for hepatitis B, still we treat 10 to 15 percent of the patients with interferon according to the guidelines and specific characteristics. There is nothing that changed in the, in the, in the CD8 responses, CD4 and CD8 responses. Here are the CD8 shown. So in this period, in these first six months, we know that there is an inhibition of transcription uh, from the CCC DNA of the virus. So the epigenetic control on the virus is there and precedes and explains the activity of, uh, of, um, of, of interferon. And just one last slide. What is the future? We will not probably continue to give interferon. We are trying to combine with nukes. The results are still very open and not clear. 
so that, that we should have some better strategy to, to induce interferon what is needed, because interferon is up to date the only strategy that may uh, increase the, uh, if you, we potentiate interferon, we, we can get more functional cure. And the one way to do it is to use a TLR7 agonist. There is a drug that is uh, already in clinical development, and actually this uh, TLR7 agonist produced by Gilead, uh, is uh, active at nanomolar potency, is a very strong antiviral, very few pro-inflammatory responses. Why? Because it induces the response directly in the liver. It activates the production of interferon alpha by dendritic cells and other uh, non-parenchymal cells in the liver, and this means more activity, less side effects, and uh, and uh, obviously a kind of directed uh, activity as we have with different, with different. And we know that is safe in chronic hepatitis B patients, not only normal volunteers, and in animal models is very very effective in inducing the clearance of HBSG that is co that is uh, considered today the most important. Uh, the most important uh, uh, correlate for functional cure. Can we go over functional cure to eradication? One way might be to target the core protein. The core protein does not only influence the innate immunity, but also influence the CCCDNA activity. And we show at this, the paper is under, under uh, evaluation uh, by, by a journal. And so we have now different ways to think about hepatitis B, which interferon may still have a role. In theory, the better way would be eradicate CCCDNA, but we are not still there. Anticapsid, a little effect. Few other approaches by other groups, a little effect. We are not still there. We are still striving for a finite therapy that would be very good for the patient. Don't get interferon. They get already two years of interferon, but nobody can tell them to take five or ten years of interferon at the dosages we gave, we give to them, not the, the, the patients from Robin Foie group that got it for a long way. And so for functional cure, we are thinking of something that might be a way to deliver interferon or induce interferon locally to mix with some epigenetic drugs that might increase the effect of interference, so all the uh, new ways we meet there. The truly immunomodulatory approach, only immunomodulatory approach, is uh, really the beginning, but is promising because of the results of the Gilead uh, TLR7 agonist uh, drug. And these are the people that I have to thank for the experimental data they showed. Thank you, I wonder whether there is a very short, short question. So coming back to HCB, we have to stop to work on interferon and we have to start to work on the right by because maybe it, is, it will stay in this scenario for several years. But I wonder, you, you said very well that in Ribavirin may repress specific genes which may be important for the uh, recovery from the infection. How can we explain that the nucleotide analogs may do this kind of job? So repressing some gene. So, uh, we, we gave an explanation in terms of who is the effector of this. We do not still know how ribavirin activates G9 and tells G9 to go on these promoters. So we do not have all the scenario, but we know that this uh, effect of ribavirin is mediated by a specific uh, component of the cellular machinery. So we, we still miss one, one, uh, one ring. Regarding ribavirin and interferon, uh, there will be always some need for very strong uh, therapy with multiple drugs, possibly including interferon in non-responder patients, because we still, even with the triple therapy, three drugs, $90,000 per treatment, uh, with the three drugs from Abbott, we still have 5% of non-responders. So we will have, but the problem is the mentality about using interferon will change in this patient, because the patient will not like to get interferon if they can Just go without. Just to give a final, a very short, very short answer. Just to give a, a final clear-cut take-home message. So the the ICG expressed in PPR are not reflecting what is happening in the liver. That's no. The answer is no. That is quite clear. Okay. They do not reflect the liver. And then, very very poorly. 
Yeah, and, and another message is that uh, the interferon alpha seems to be pathogenic in some way, while interferon lambda, that's not for sure, but may cause the recovery from the infection, independently of the therapy. Uh, that is partially true, that is true, probably, but interferon lambda has been stopped in development because the results from the clinical trial that was oh, developed right, was not, didn't show any advance. Yes. And so we will uh, not have interferon lambda for, for okay. hepatitis C. Okay. One question, very short, please. Okay, it's very short. Uh, you say that in your final conclusion, that there is no hepatitis C vaccine for hepatitis C. Yes. Uh, is do you have any uh, candidate for is to silence some epigenetic factors? We Does we with the to use maybe effective of your We we have uh, we have sh not published yet, but we show with the two um, international congresses now that by using uh, a, a, a an agonist of Zest2, you can potentiate interferon effect. And by using an activator of a CIRT1 of the same family of those that are used in steatohepatitis in uh, animal models, uh, you can do that. The problem with these drugs at the stage is that they are not yet drugs, they are compounds, so they, are, they have not very good in pharmacodynamics. And second thing is that uh, uh, there might be some concerns about uh, stimulating for long time CIRT or ZEST in terms of potential negative interaction with oncogenesis and whatever. So uh, they are candidate, but they are not probably what we will finally use unless we have a very smart way to use them. Okay, thank you Massimo.